Order in the court. The Supreme Court of Florida is now in session. The Honorable Chief Justice Charles T. Kennedy presiding. Good morning and welcome to this session of the Florida Supreme Court. The first case on our docket today is the case of Florida, the state of Florida versus Garcia. Council. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Mr. Chief Justice. May it please this court, Assistant Attorney General Paul Patty on behalf of the state. In rebuttal to respondents motion for downward departure, seeking a probationary sentence, allegedly having cancer and allegedly following the guidelines for house arrest, the state relied on several incidents of threats that this uh, respondent made against two state witnesses, a police officer, and one of his own friends, where he pulled out and pointed a firearm at him. The fourth DCA, disregarding the explicit limitation of these considerations, instead reached into the record and stated that the trial court impermissibly considered subsequent misconduct in imposing the sentence in violation of this court's normal. This is wrong for a multitude of reasons. First of all, as alluded to, the express limitation by the, the state in considering this misconduct and denying his downward departure motion and, and directly rebutting this assertion that he was a good candidate for probation and that he followed the rules of house arrest. Second, it's not clear from the record at all that the trial court considered this information for anything other than denying the downward departure motion uh, or considered it at all. Indeed, the fourth DCA stated that it could neither determine from the record that indeed it did, the trial court did in, uh, consider the information or that it did not consider the information, only that it may. This is an express and direct conflict with this court's Harvard and Alford, which stand for the proposition that we need to trust our trial courts to enforce, uh, properly follow the law. And indeed in Harvard, this court stated that it rejected an argument stating that it, the trial court could have considered mis uh, improper sentencing factors in that case. Counsel, is it is it the state's position that the information that was allegedly considered by the trial court was established by a preponderance of the evidence? Absolutely, Your Honor. It, it was established by a preponderance of the evidence. The, the state presented uh, certain jail calls, uh, including threats to two witnesses. Uh, different phone calls between respondent and his family, either his ex-wife or his son. And there was a bond revocation hearing also detailing uh, three different witnesses and the threats made against them. So the state stands behind it. This is proven by a preponderance of the evidence. And that gets me to my next point. Uh, the next reason that it's improper, uh, the fourth DCA's opinion is, is improper is that Subsequent misconduct is not an improper sentencing consideration. As Chief Justice Kennedy's dissent in Norville eloquently put, the PSI and the CPC statutes and the due process clause don't prohibit subsequent arrests from being considered. Certainly not subsequent misconduct as the fourth DCA and the second DCA have been impermissibly expanded beyond Norville. So the state is asking also to recede from Norville to the extent that it's been interpreted as prohibiting all subsequent misconduct, but certainly subsequent arrests are a valid consideration. Uh, and finally, uh, the, the state finds that uh, the fourth DCA, and as this issue was not briefed, it wasn't proper for the fourth DCA to reach into the record and sui sponte raise and then rule on this issue. Now, uh, at this point, uh, I'm prepared to reserve the rest of my time for rebuttal unless there's any questions that uh, Court would like to ask. I have one question, just, just out of curiosity. Uh, what about a situation where a person is arrested subsequent to this particular arrest, and that case goes to trial first, and he's found not guilty? Could that be considered in the sentencing in the previous case? Absolutely, Your Honor. Uh, that would go into what is put in conduct. And I understand that the Florida law. Uh, well, what, 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 what does not guilty mean? Uh, that he didn't do it, or at least under the eyes of the law. So how can that be considered? Well, under Watts, the, under the due process clause, uh, it's, it's not impermissible to consider acquitted conduct by the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, this is not 
this is not a situation where this is what it kind of I understand that. I understand that. But but again, you know, you, you, you're dealing with is not guilty and if not guilty by a jury or by a judge or not guilty, just you're presumed to be not guilty. Uh, well, is there the, a difference between the two? Well, I understand, Your Honor. There, there, there is some case law in terms of acquitted conduct, but that's just conjecture at this point. And now uh, not all of the misconduct that occurred is necessarily criminal. So you wouldn't necessarily be acquitted. You know, there were several, there were several violations in, in, in bond, is it, uh, his conditions bond, like not drinking, stuff like, stuff like that, that is valid consideration, but occurs subsequent and is misconduct after the underlying offense. That's why this, this interpretation of the fourth and second DCAs is just overly broad. There's no way that a trial court couldn't consider this information. Now, I, I acknowledge that there is certain Florida case law as to acquitted conduct. I believe that's incorrect. Now, that is not certainly before this court because he has not been acquitted of anything. And to my knowledge, he hasn't been arrested or charged for any of these threats that were made. But still, this is a valid consideration at a minimum to deny a respondent's motion for downward departure, even if it is acquitted conduct. It's, he's making an assertion that he is a good candidate for probation and that he had followed the rules of house arrest. The, the state's allowed to rebut that, clearly. Russell, is it your position that the state would have been, would have been appropriate for the state to present this information if he had not asked for a downward departure? It is the state's position that uh, it was proper to present this from, uh, information uh, regardless of the downward departure, but that's kind of outside of the facts of this case. This is, the respondent very clearly put this in uh, at issue. So even if you deem the state's incorrect on that position, that doesn't, that's not dispositive of this case. One other question, would you agree that um, for this post-arrest misconduct or post-offense um, misconduct to be considered, um, if it is allowed, that due process would have to be um, considered and that the defendant would have to be given proper notice that the state intended to rely on that um, misconduct and an opportunity if he needed to, to marshal whatever he needed in order to, to prove that it couldn't be substantiated. You're absolutely correct, Your Honor. That is an absolute important prospect of due process. And I, the state in no way challenges the uh, defendant's right to challenge whatever state, uh, evidence the state puts forth. And that, we do not challenge that at all. Right. It, it, defendant is cl clearly within its right to challenge such evidence. Uh, all we're asking is, there, is a very simple concept. Uh, we want due process too. It, arbitrarily cutting off subsequent misconduct for no particular reason, particularly in a case where the respondent puts forth the evidence that's contrary or puts, uh, puts forth an asser assertion that's contrary to what the evidence that states is for. It's, it's a proper consideration, and but absolutely, defendants are allowed to challenge that. If no further questions, I'll reserve the rest of my time. Thank you, counsel. Can you go ahead? Please do. Okay, thank you, Your Honor. Um, may it please the court, my name is Claire Medell, and I'm here on behalf of respondent Tony Garcia. The prosecutor in this case flagrantly violated a bright line rule that has existed for half a decade, indicating that the prosecutor did not care to learn the law or did not care about what it was. The trial court was obviously influenced by the argument. It overruled an objection to the improper argument, said it was considering all the evidence and the state's argument, and then imposed the exact sentence the state requested. The fourth district properly applied normal and concluded that Mr. Garcia was entitled to a new sentencing hearing without the taint of inadmissible subsequent misconduct. Um, Turning to the merits, petitioner has asked and made so many arguments that it's, it was difficult for me to know where to start. I do want to start with this assertion that the state is saying that the misconduct was directed at the downward departure motion. Absolutely not. That is not what the record says. So I want to point out that the first time that petitioner brought this up is in his initial brief to this court. It was not in the motion for rehearing. It was not in the jurisdictional brief. And the reason is because it's not supported by the record. If you go to the state's motion in this case, they have a section called, quote, defendant relevant conduct since his arrest. Okay, that's page 478 of the record. And then they have a separate section called state's objection to a downward departure. And that section talks about why they should downward, 
they should deny the downward departure. And all the argument there is on the ground that Mr. Garcia did not sufficiently show that he currently has cancer as opposed to previously has cancer. Again, at the sentencing hearing, the state again focused on there was insufficient evidence of the departure grounds. They never used the post arrest conduct. At the sentencing hearing, they argue against the downward departure motion, and then they specifically transition to justifying their 84 month sentence. And that's how they use the downward departure. Then, um, that's how, sorry, that's how they use the post arrest misconduct. Um, I think, yes, there is one line in the downward departure motion mentioning that he complied with his house arrest conditions. However, opening the door is a limited context, a concept to the extent it applies in sentencing when neither the defendant nor the state rely on that line at the sentencing hearing, it does not blow the door wide open for the state to spend two thirds of its time talking about an inadmissible. Now, counsel, you uh, would agree, wouldn't you, that Norval speaks to um, post-conviction arrests, not post-conviction misconduct writ large, right? Does the, I agree that that is what the text of Norval said. That argument raised by petitioner should be deemed waived. It was raised for the first time in his reply brief to this court, not raised in his initial brief. But I think the on that point, of course, Norval has to apply to post-arrest misconduct. If, nor, if the CPC precludes subsequent misconduct, a fortiori, it includes, it um, precludes consideration of post-arrest misconduct. And it's to say that whether or not a normal violation exists turns on the prosecutor's unreviewable charging discretion is an arbitrary line. It also discourages the state from complying with the federal and state constitutions because well, what I, they're in. Is I'm, I'm glad you raised the, the the Constitution of the United States. If if your argument is right, what do we do about the fact that the U.S. Supreme Court has repeatedly held that even acquitted conduct can be considered at sentencing? The United States Supreme Court did hold that in Watts. The Florida due process clause is more protective and cannot consider acquitted conduct. The reason that subsequent misconduct is allowed in federal court, it's not a constitutional consideration. It's because the legislature has a statute that expressly authorizes consideration of all conduct, past, um, past and subsequent. We don't have that. The, the, Petitioner's argument is the atextual one. You know, we're all textualists now. The CPC, as Norval said, the CPC is unambiguous about what it, what a trial court is allowed to consider. And it says the, the primary offense and prior record. It does not say subsequent offense. So I, you know, I think the constitutional argument is a little bit of a red herring in the sense that this Norval is a statutory interpretation case. Petitioner's asking this court to read words into the CPC that post, or post um, arrest misconduct is allowed. And you know the federal courts don't really give us much there because they have a specific statute. If the Florida legislature wants to adopt a statute that says post arrest conduct can be considered, then we'll deal with the constitutional. Is it, is it Mr. Garcia's position though that the CPC requires the sentencing court to consider only the PSI and nothing else at sentencing? because I'm not sure I find that in the CPC. No, I, I, just, I agree with your honor. It is not our position that they should only consider the PSI. Mostly what our, our position is relying on is not the PSI statute, it's section 921.002, which says the penalty imposed should be commensurate with the severity of the primary offense and the circumstances surrounding the primary offense. And the severity of the, um, and it also says the severity of the sentence increases with the length and nature of the prior record. And it also says use of incarcerative sanctions is prioritized towards serious offenses and people with longer records. What happened here is the state said, hey, I don't like the CPC policy doesn't really help us here because, you know, he doesn't really have a serious prior record. And while an arson is a serious case, no one was harmed in this case. No one was in the house. So what do we got to do? We got to focus on things that the legislature has said are irrelevant. Or at the very least, the legislature has said, you know, that's not what the primary focus is on. If you continue to adhere to normal, which is good law, and stare to see if principles apply, the state trial courts will still have tons of discretion at sentencing to impose. They can, well, the nature of the prior record, there are so many factors there. Is it an escalating scale of conduct? Are they all the same crimes? Is he escalating from crimes of property to crimes of violence? And then with the primary offense itself, there's so many different aspects that can be considered, like 
was the art was there someone in the house was anyone harmed you know how close was mr garcia to neighbors yeah i mean i think the psi normal use of the psi statute is to is used to buttress the fact that 921.002 lists the appropriate factors and the psi statute confirms what that says but i i agree with your honor that you're not limited to the psi statute um i also wanted to briefly mention a about the allegations, about the fact that the allegations at the bond hearing, a bond hearing that was held over defense objection without really any time to prepare, they're not related to the underlying facts of this case. Um, although it involved a state witness, it's only because they're neighbors. It's like a neighborly dispute that has nothing to do with this. One neighbor wanted to borrow Mr. Garcia's tools, and then Mr. Garcia said no, so that neighbor got mad and ruined his recliner, and then Mr. Garcia allegedly threatened him. And so, when the state is bringing this up and spending so much time at sentencing, they're really pulling the trial court away from what the CPC says is relevant, which is the arson and Mr. Garcia's record. Um, I also wanted to say we disagree with the trial, the petitioner's claim that the evidence was established by a preponderance of the evidence. There was no finding ever made that on that, and this court cannot make a finding in the first instance. Um, we agree, disagree that there was a preponderance of evidence because it's not clear the trial court listened to the jail calls and the bond hearing was, as I mentioned, held like basically the defense was sandbagged because the state filed it immediately and brought in a new witness and Mr. Garcia was hospitalized due to his illness. So they didn't have an opportunity to respond or really do anything at that hearing. At the very least, if you're going to, you know, overrule Norval and send us back you know, there needs to be a finding in the first place that it was by a preponderance. I want to go back to acquitted conduct real quick because I think Justice LaBarga brings up a good point. Norval, while I think is a statutory interpretation case, does have a constitutional dimension in that the bright, the bright line rule aspect of it does protect against certain constitutional violations. For example, what do we do in a situation, say Mr. Garcia was charged with assault, what if he was acquitted at trial? Do we Does he get to redo this sentencing hearing? I don't even know what the procedural mechanism would be for that. And also, I think Justice Lawson was the one who asked this about giving them an opportunity to respond. But as the fourth DCA recognized in its original normal opinion, that kind of, that puts the defendant in between a rock and a hard place because he has to choose between defending himself at the sentencing hearing or subsequent misconduct and waiving his right, his privilege against self-discrimination, his right to remain silent. If he chooses to try to rebut the allegations, they, that whatever he says could be used against him in a future case. The United States, another constitutional dimension is the United States Supreme Court has held that you cannot be sentenced based on material misinformation. Norval helps protect that by saying, hey, if there's subsequent misconduct, the defendant should be punished for that conduct at the subsequent hearing. And for example, in this case, if the state had charged Mr. Garcia with assault at the subsequent hearing, they could rely on the arson and the fact that it was somehow tied up with the arson, which I don't think is necessarily true. And at that point, they would get to do all the considerations they're asking for here. Mr. Garcia's position is not that this behavior can never be considered. His position is that the state needs to follow the Constitution and charge and convict him of it before that material is considered. Doesn't the PSI statute uh, talk about uh, the person's arre prior arrest record being part of the PSI, not just conviction? Which seems like that, you know, raises some of these same issues that you're talking about, and yet the legislature explicitly put that in there. It does say prior record of arrests and convictions, but it does not say, I think crucially, does not say subsequent record of arrests or convictions. But it's the and same, that, I mean, it's the same, I mean, the same principle applies, I mean, in the sense that yeah. I, I understand you're saying that if it's a prior conviction, then there's by definition been process and whatever, but with the prior arrest, I mean, there could be the same types of ambiguities that you're talking about now, and yet the legislature still explicitly included that. Would I you think say that there aren't due process issues? I'm just, from a statutory perspective, um, it seems like that's a, a an issue that's sort of baked into the statute. I agree. Yes, Your Honor, I agree that a lot of the uh, do, constitutional issues I've been um, talking about do apply to, quote, prior record of arrest. However, I think if we're talking about text, it says prior record of arrest. It doesn't say subsequent record of arrest. And I do think that um, 
subsequent subsequent arrests do pose heightened constitutional considerations because of the acquitted conduct concept and the privilege against them incrimination if the prior arrest and they haven't actually gone through the process of convicting them it, it may it, it's more likely that it hasn't happened yet or i mean that it's, it's not going to happen so would um, you would you I acknowledge think, i'm sorry to interrupt you would you oh, acknowledge, no, I mean, so basically your textual argument is a, it's an expressio unius argument right i mean mm -hmm. there's no explicit prohibition i mean would you acknowledge that this is sort of on the you know if you read this if you read the portions of the statute that you cite there's nothing on its face that would indicate that it's purporting to sort of lay out a, a comprehensive uh, list of things that can be considered. I mean, it seems like it's more sort of statements of principle. It just, it seems to me like this is a very weak expressio unius uh, application. I mean, do you have any, any response to that? I do disagree that it's not purporting to put on limitations because it does say the provision of the 921.02 Subsection one says the provision of criminal penalties and limitations upon the applications of such penalties belongs to the legislature. And then they say, basically, here we go. We're going to lay out those um, penalties and limitations. I think um, the other Where's the thing I would like to say. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but okay. just to be fair, I mean, where you're you're essentially reading this as if it is if we could see on the words on the page, the court may not consider subsequent misconduct obviously those words are not on the page so you're asking us to kind of read that limitation in and i'm asking you to kind of show us the argument for why we should read that sort of a limitation into the language that's on the page well this court already did read this limitation in in normal i mean that was the basis of the opinion i think sort of to flip the question on your head what language is petitioner relying upon to say that you can consider subsequent misconduct. I think, they, um, and the other thing I would say is, I really do urge this court to look at the federal statute. Um, it's cited, it's talked about extensively in Pepper, which is a case cited by um, petitioner in their reply brief. In Pepper, they talk about the federal statute that authorizes consideration of, consideration of post-arrest misconduct. And we don't have that here. So I think if this court is going to hold that a trial court can consider post-arrest misconduct because the CPC doesn't expressly disavow it, I think that is an atextual position. I, I understand what you're saying. There's nowhere, nowhere in the CPC does it say we are limited to these factors, although Norval did interpret the CPC as saying that. But what is the point of the legislature repeatedly pointing out, we care about the primary offense and the prior record. We can care about contemporary offenses we care about prior record. What is the point of them repeatedly saying that if this court is going to sit as a second legislature and say, well, they must have also included post arrest misconduct. They must have meant that as well, even though they didn't put it in there. Even though doesn't the, doesn't the legislature though legislate against back, certain background assumptions? I mean, is there, can you point to anything that would say that there's a long standing history in Florida that, that, you know, these are the only things that may be considered by a court? They, on that point, they do, I guess, I don't know if I agree that they legislate based on background assumptions because I well, think that's obviously, I mean, that's position. really not debatable, but go, go ahead. Okay. Um, and I was going to say on that point, Norville's existed for six years and the legislature hasn't overruled it, even though, you know, they could have, and they were invited to by a fifth DCA judge. And in fact, the CPC is up for debate on the legislature. There was a task force this year that did not recommend overruling Norville, although it did avoid other ones. Um, but to, I guess, the if they are going against long-standing principles, I don't know why they said in the CPC that the limitations upon such applications of such penalties belong to us, and here here's what we said. And let's say, I guess, say your honors want to overrule Norval and um, say that post-arrest misconduct can be considered. I don't think it can be debated that the CPC says the primary focus of the sentence should be on the prior record and contemporary offense. And I also don't think it's debatable that counsel, this sentence let wasn't. Me, let me ask you this, counsel. Couldn't we uh, reasonably understand uh, the, the references you're, uh, you're uh, focusing on there um, as what is baked into the lowest permissible sentence into the kind of the, the score sheet? 
And because those are the things that go into the score sheet. But then we've got this other principle here that, that is operative under the criminal punishment code, which is kind of like the overarching principle uh, under the criminal punishment code is that the trial court has the discretion to give a sentence up to the statutory maximum. Um, that's the basic uh, framework. And then there's the lowest, there is a limitation um, at the, at the, on the low end, but not on the high end. Isn't that correct? Isn't that the basic framework of the criminal punishment code? Um, Your Honor, I think this is an argument that Fisher raises in their reply brief. I actually chuckled because well, I question, have been always- well, it's a question I just asked you, so. Yes, yes, let me ask. The lowest permissible, first of all, I wanna say, you're saying that the primary offense and prior record only go towards lowest permissible sentence and other considerations need to be considered to get us up to the statutory max. That's not what 921.002 says. It says um, the penalty imposed must be commensurate with the severity of the offense. And the severity of the offense increases with the length and nature of the prior record. It does not say that these principles are limited to the lowest permissible sentence. I have been arguing for years that the lowest permissible sentence that a judge should not be able to go above the lowest permissible sentence based on factors already baked into the code. If this court wants to adopt that rule, I would be so happy. And it would require reversal here because the 84 month sentence is above the well, lowest not, permissible it, that's sentence. Not, that's not, I mean, you have not uh, prevailed on that view. Um, yeah, but, but that's what the argument is, isn't it? That, that what you're asking me is you're asking me to adopt, say, isn't that the purpose of the lowest permissible sentence? I don't, I mean, this court, courts have repeatedly rejected it and the CPC is not, nowhere does the CPC say that the lowest permissible sentence, that these general principles apply only to the lowest permissible sentence. And I think the fact that that provision of the statute is the only provision that petitioner can point to to support his argument textually is why the state's textual argument is so weak. I have pointed to specific provisions that say primary offense prior record. They have not. They've only pointed to that provision that you say. But kind of Please, answer Counsel, if I could interrupt and ask a question. I, I'm, I'm curious um, if a defendant is at sentence on birth is that sentencing for a charge of burglary of a dwelling? It's an F2, not enhanced, 15-year maximum um, sentence, and say that the lowest permissible sentence under the punishment code is 48 months. And the defendant um, says, I want to speak at sentencing, and then gets up and, and cusses out the trial judge, says he doesn't believe in the system, he doesn't believe in our laws, he would do this again tomorrow if he got out, um, that, that this is the way he survives in this F and F and F and country and and F you judge. Could the judge consider that misconduct in imposing the sentence? I would have to think about it, Your Honor, because obviously that's not the situation here. Obviously, the court there could hold him in contempt and punish him in contempt for that behavior. Um, I think a little bit of him saying he's going to do it in the future um, is about, you know, um, could be relevant because it's not necessarily post mis subsequent misconduct, excuse me. Well, the, but the, the tirade, the tirade would certainly be considered misconduct, right? It's certainly, yeah. I guess and it is. Say something about the defendant and his, his propensity to, to perhaps commit a crime again. It, but you don't, you think that's questionable as to whether the judge can consider that? I think it is questionable, mostly. This is why I'm hesitating a little bit. It's one of the benefits of normal is that it's a bright line rule and it's easy to apply in future cases. So if we said it just applied to this case, um, it would, you know, it would be easy and we wouldn't have to go down these difficult paths of figuring out what happened. I think in that well, case- let me, let me ask you a different okay. question and I think I understand the answer I'm gonna get to that question. Um, if the defendant comes in and says, um, I'd like to speak at sentence, sentencing, um, judge, I know I made a mistake. I will never do this again. In fact, these are the steps that I've taken after my arrest in order to, to improve myself. I've, I've done this, I've done this. You know, I've taken this anger management course. I, I've, I've really, I've done community service. I've done this volunteerism. I've, I've given back to the community in ways. Um, could the state object and say, wait, 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 you, you can't consider post-arrest conduct even if it's not misconduct. 
could could the state object to that or is that would that be an appropriate consideration no they could not object to that and hold on i wrote a specific section about this because i recognize that some people think it might be unfair to say that the defense gets to bring up post arrest behavior but that the state cannot and to what i say is that to that i say the court is bound by the legislature's policy and the legislature you know they could have reasonably thought we want trial courts to consider prior and contemporaneous conduct and not subsequent conduct because that's what people should really be about. This is about punishment for the primary offense. Um, however, the defendant has a different constitutional right, a constitutional right to present any and all evidence that will bear on the sentence. The state doesn't have that right. They're limited on a lot of ways. I mean, they can't rely on the defendant's race, although, of course, the defendant could be like, excuse, because of my racial background, this is why this case happened. And um, also, there may be no other time for a defendant to bring up subsequent mitigating evidence except at that sentencing hearing. The state always has the option to bring up potential misconduct that rises to the level of an arrest if they charge someone with that crime later. So, um, so what if the state, in response to the defendant's presentation, wanted to say, well, Judge, he says that he's reformed, but, but we have evidence of misconduct that occurred post-arrest then maybe we can get into the opening the door concept that petitioner advances. I guess the problem in this case is that it, that concept doesn't apply because they were using it to ask for um, a harsher sentence and not to respond to the downward departure motion. I think that would be I a difficult- I apologize, I've used all your time plus some, so. Like yes, that. I know, Your Honor. It, it, Justice, Counsel, Justice Kennedy, you, do you mind uh, if I do a conclusion? You need to sum up in about 15 seconds. Okay, I can do it. <laughs> it should not be controversial to say that criminal defendants should be punished for the crime for which they were convicted, not extraneous conduct that happened after the fact. If the state wants to punish a defendant for particular behavior, then it needs to charge and convict that defendant for that behavior. The fourth district properly found that the record reasonably suggested that the trial court impermissibly considered post-arrest misconduct. This court should decline petitioner's invitation to create a new rule, a more complicated and convoluted test than normal, and it should not overrule normal simply because the composition of the court is changing. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, there's a lot to unpack here. Uh, so I want to start with basically that the state didn't raise any of these issues. It's, bit counterintuitive, but this issue wasn't even raised in the briefing below. I don't know how the, uh, the state can be faulted for not addressing this before the motion for hearing. Now, the due process argument that was made, or excuse me, the, due, the downward departure argument that was made in the motion for hearing, I, I think uh, opposing counsel faults me for not explicitly stating that the respondent was seeking probation and that as part of that downward departure, that was the entire purpose. He wanted probation, and yes, that was one line, but that was an assertion that he made that he followed the, the rules of house arrest, and the state was allowed to rebut that. Um, in terms of the, the, the structure of how the state limited this consideration, it's important to remember that the sentencing memorandum is broken into several different sections. And the first section is facts relevant to sentencing. Uh, the section that opposing counsel refers to is yes, that's that's the subsequent misconduct. But first of all, that, that subsequent misconduct was not mentioned in the facts relevant to sentencing section. And it was not even part of any of the analysis later on in the sentencing memo, and not even part of the ultimate conclusion in terms of what sentence was appropriate for respondent. And at the sentencing hearing, the first thing out of the state's mouth when it wanted to, to, to argue the point, it said it was going to rely on the sentencing memorandum and imposing the proper sentence for uh, respondent, but that it wanted to argue against the downward departure and explicitly brought out all of this uh, or elaborated on the subsequent misconduct. Those are the only purposes that it was raised. So trying to blend can all tight, these together. Can you, can you sort of tighten that up? So for a fundamental error analysis, the error has to be clear from the record. And so what I'm hearing you saying is that putting aside the rightness of normal and all that, are you saying that it's not clear from the record that these factors were were kind of implicit in the in the court's decision to impose the seven year sentence? Absolutely, Your Honor. That okay. is 
And so what's the, so just make sort of the most concise kind of statement of why we should read the record in a way to say that the, you know, that, that a reasonable reading of the record would at least create ambiguity as to whether the factors were considered. Of course, Your Honor. So the, I will, the state admits that there was a kind of an overlap between the due brought the downward departure and the ultimate sentence. Now, what makes it clear that it's unclear is that the trial court stated that it had considered all the evidence, which is what respondent and the fourth and say hang their hat on that, for, that the trial court considered it. But the next sentence, the next statement out of the, the trial court's mouth was, I don't think this is a case that should, I should depart. So I do not believe that it's patent or it's clear from the record that any of the subsequent kind of specifically argued at the sentencing hearing was considered in the ultimate sentence. It was considered- And so the, it seems like the strongest argument on this issue for the other side is that you guys asked for seven years and that's what the court did. And so what's the best evidence in the record for the notion that the seven year recommendation that the state made did not factor in the subsequent misconduct? Uh, that would be in the, the sentencing memorandum. It made it pretty clear that, it, like I said, it, it, there is a section that, like, that identifies that there is subsequent acts of, of threats that were made, but that was never brought up again in the sentencing memorandum and not in the final conclusion. The, sent, uh, the state emphasized the underlying facts of this offense in coming to the seven-year conclusion it had nothing to do with the subsequent misconduct at all. Uh, so that's the clearest point on that. Uh, in terms of, uh, very quickly, the due process clause in the Florida Constitution is broader. I don't believe that's correct. The, there's no substantive difference in the text that I can see from the due process section uh, of the Florida Constitution or the due process clause. So I don't know where that was going. Uh, I believe just uh, Chief Justice Kennedy, you, you hit it right on the head in terms of the CPC calculation. It's baked into that calculation, these, these things that the legislature deemed appropriate because they only wanted to limit the, the discretion of the trial court underneath the lowest permissible sentencing score. And if respondent's interpretation is correct, then 1, 1G of 921.002 is basically invalid. I don't, I don't understand how we can list out all these things that are supposed to be calculated in the score and, and, and subsequent uh, statute section are explicitly stated as, to, as part of the calculation, how you can ignore that. It's within this, the discretion to go, the trial court to go up to the statutory maximum. Um, this, the state's not asking for a factual finding by this court. It, it's asking, it's similar to what you would find in a JOA argument. Substantiation is just recognition that sufficient evidence exists to substantiate the underlying misconduct. Now it's obviously not a, a perfect corollary because misconduct doesn't necessarily have to be a crime. So all the state is asking is if there's minimum evidence to say that there's substantiation here. Um, bone revocation hearing, there's, there's, it's, it's a meritless argument. It, it, they hang your hat on the, that defendant wasn't there. But that, first of all, that's kind of a misinterpretation of the facts. Respondent was given leave to further seek bond later on. In fact, twice tried to do so. So, and even the attorneys that were there even cross-examined the three witnesses that stated that they had threats by respondent. Um, the state would argue that discretions wouldn't exist under respondent's interpretation because if if everything's already clear in the CPC code and everything's in the PSI. I'm not even sure there's a purpose in holding a sentencing here. If everything's already presented in those in that report or in the CPC code, and it's kind of a dual-edged sword, how do you have due process where, and a right, due process is a right that belongs to everyone, not just criminal defendants, including the state. We have a right to rebut. Counsel, where, where, where do you get the concept that due process belongs to the state? Uh, it's it's from a, a multitude of different cases, but simply Can that. Can you cite one for me? Sure. Uh, it's part of the reply brief. Uh, 
Because you would agree the due process clause of the Constitution does not protect the state or apply to the state. No, the, the U.S. Constitution. I'm saying that the, the state has due process rights at uh, at a, in a judicial setting to introduce evidence and to have a, it, the due process is fundamentally fairness. As this court is well aware, it's not fair to cut off the the state's rights arbitrarily, and that's what happened in, at least with the fourth DCA and second DCA's interpretation of moral that. All subsequent misconduct cannot be considered at a sentencing hearing of any kind for any purpose. That's not due process. Due process is we put forth our evidence, and the defense is absolutely allowed to put forth whatever impeachment uh, explanation or, or count, uh, counter evidence that it would like to do. That's due process. Uh, but that now, usually arises from a rule or uh, a statute, correct, that allows the state to prosecute a case or present evidence. That's not really due process, inherent due process. I, I mean, I believe there is an inherent right for, for a state to have some due process rights. Now, certainly the, there are more rights that are explicitly spelled, spelled out for defendants, such as you know, the, the right to double, no double jeopardy, that kind of thing that override due process rights that you know we we don't have a right to retry them because he has a right or she has a right to to not be tried twice for the same offense uh, but there's no restriction really that the state doesn't have due process rights otherwise i'm having trouble looking at it it is in my reply brief i apologize and, uh, but I, I just want to kind of hit all the points i hope i've answered your question um thank you Uh, back to simply the normal's bright line rule in practice has been actually very dim uh, and it kind of denies logic how normal explicitly says that the bright line rule is you cannot the trial court cannot consider subsequent arrests without conviction how that the fourth dca and the second dca got to subsequent misconduct of any kind and I, I believe this co comes down to a fundamental uh, unclarity of Norval. I believe the, the issue in Norval, and, that, and like I said, this is not clear, this is my interpretation, is that the underlying trial court relied on an arrest, the mere existence of an arrest, to substantiate or to find that the actual offense occurred. Now, arrests, the state concedes, are not substantiated. Those only require probable cause. So that doesn't well, mean I think, in, I think in Norville, there were there was actually some um, fingerprints on a CD case. So there was not not just right. the arrest, there was some evidence, whether it was adequately proven or what the majority thought there about it's one thing, but it's not like it, 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 I don't think in Norville that it was just the, uh, if, if that's what you were saying, that in Norville, it was just uh, the, the fact of the arrest that the state was relying on. Of, of course, John, you would even know better than I, as you were <laughs> part of normal. But uh, I, I, that's kind of what I'm saying. But I, I think what it came down to is that the, it wasn't substantiated. I mean, you're correct. There is some evidence uh, in terms of fingerprints on, on a CD case that was inside of the car, and I believe there's a victim statement. But it's kind of sounded as if it was just an affidavit, not like testimony or anything like that. So I think it comes down to there wasn't adequate proof. But counsel, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I mean, the the thing with normal is. From the statutory interpretation perspective, the court, for better or worse, right or wrong, interpreted the statute as supposedly unambiguously listing out the factors that can be considered, which don't, you know, there's nothing in there that talks affirmatively about these issues. And so, you know, although the court talks about the bright line rule that wouldn't apply here, I mean, the, the, the interpretive principle that they announced is if I can't find affirmative permission to consider this in the statute then i can't consider it and so it would apply to you know to all post post offensive conviction misconduct correct uh, that that's been the interpretation of fourth and second dca um, and it's but, based on what the court said what the print you know the principle that it articulated right i understand judge uh all i'll say that's why if uh, none of the other arguments are accepted that the state is asking to receive from normal because that's not an appropriate uh, interpretation of the statutes. Um, but with that, I, I just 
think I'm 17 seconds over. Uh, quickly, uh, all the state is asking is that due process belongs to everyone and uh, due process should be followed. The state should be allowed to present evidence of subsequent access if it bears relevant to this underlying sentencing. Uh, and in this particular case, it was specifically only introduced for a uh, providing a downward departure, and that was a permissible consideration by the trial court. With that, uh, I thank you very much for your time. Uh, and thank you. We thank you both for your arguments in this case today. The court will now uh, prepare to take up the second case on the docket. The court will now proceed to hearing argument in the case of Robinson versus State. Counsel? Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. May it please the court. Matthew Salvi representing the petitioner, Henry Lee Robinson. I would like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal. This court should reverse the decision by the Second District Court of Appeal when it certified conflict and receded from its own case law requiring notice is an element to the offense of driving while license revoked as a habitual traffic offender. Prior to the holdings below, notice was a required element for this charge, starting in 2001 with Rogers and in 2002 with Fields. Um, those cases did determine that notice is an element to the offense. Because the legislature should have been aware, is presumed to be aware of the judicial construction, they chose not to make any changes starting from 2001 beyond to Section 5. It's presumed that they were aware of that and that that was their intent to agree with that construction. By removing notice, the Second District Court of Appeal has erred in making this crime uh, essentially a strict liability. It, it violates due process. Um, they're, they're don't, uh, the construction that the Second DCA has made is essentially that uh, they don't have to require any kind of notice, any kind of knowledge. Uh, it would also lead to an absurd result. Counsel, isn't it presumed, counsel, isn't it presumed in this case that by the time someone is considered HTO, that they would have received numerous notices that their license is suspended um, and therefore they have knowledge that they are driving on a suspended license well you know they're, they're that so a person might be aware of prior suspensions but those are also prior offenses we're talking about a new classification a new offense a new revocation and right uh, but wouldn't the wouldn't the due process issue be more of a did this person know they were subject to a third degree felony now versus a misdemeanor rather than did this person know they were committing a crime uh, I, I see your honor's point there but I, I think the concern would be that the person may not be aware um, you know they could obviously there could be an incorrect designation uh, the conviction could be overturned the plea could be set aside but they could have done taken steps to try to uh, clarify or correct their license and still be unaware of uh, the HTO revocation. So, um, you know, that's the whole point of notice is to give them notice that, look, you do not Counsel, have a counsel to, to, to be clear here, in this case, there's nothing like that. I mean, uh, Mr. Robinson um, just had a long history of uh, 
kind of scofflaw behavior in in driving when he when he when it's very clear from the record, am I right, that he knew he shouldn't be driving? It, 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 isn't that just kind of undeniable from the record that's before us here? Uh, Your Honor, there were uh, several prior offenses. Um, you know, there was there was a redacted driving record and the unredacted, but essentially, yes, there were significant uh, prior offenses. However, I the the legislature this, has intended notice. Not, there's no allegation here that this there's some mistake was made by the department um, uh, that they, they got the that they they revoked the license of the wrong person. Um, this is the guy who was driving and um, and who uh, had had these all these prior offenses that led to the uh, HTO designation. So all, all of that, all of those kind of hypothetical things that are brought up as what might happen or uh, uh, that's none of that's present here. Isn't that correct? Uh, Your Honor, I would I would say that the the statute requires notice. Um, I would I think that's the legislative intent here. And so, yeah, there might be circumstances where someone has uh, a record where the state would make a good argument that this person would have known. But I would argue that they still have to present that evidence of notice. And if he wanted to try to rebut that, um, the offender could Counsel, do that. when you say the statute requires notice, I mean, clearly subsection five of 322.34 does not require notice. Um, and you can contrast that with sections one and two, which is driving while license suspended with knowledge and without knowledge. I mean, the legislature in just previous subsection made it very clear that notice was required for driving while licensed with knowledge and they had a separate crime for something in which no not, no notice had been received. So how do you reconcile the fact that by the time they made it to subsection five, they have no such language or no such requirements? So your honor, the, the point is, uh... When you get to subsection five, what we're talking about really is penalty. They make it a third degree felony under subsection five from the get go. Um, I think that comports with the legislative intent um, that the idea behind an HTO is to to revoke someone's license for five years. And then if you drive on it to to potentially uh, subject them to up to five years in prison. Section one, of course, is a is a civil infraction. And section two starts out as a misdemeanor and it only becomes a felony under certain uh, once certain prerequisites are met. So uh, also nothing in section five says no notice, no knowledge. Section three and four, which discuss uh, respectively knowledge and notice as in any provision. Uh, um, so I think what we have here is that they haven't explicitly stated that they don't want notice or knowledge to section five. What they've said is if you violate, if you drive while your license is revoked as a habitual offender, then you're going to Based the penalty of five years in prison, but they haven't explicitly said no. We don't want notice or knowledge. In fact, notice is required under three twenty two point two five one in all these instances. And what would be the benefit of requiring notice to even start someone's license revocation if they're not sending it to someone to put them on notice of it? That's the point of it. So it, it's hard to reconcile that notice is mandatory that they have to send it out, but that they don't. They're not required to prove it. So, um, as I indicated, it's the, the separate section for five is really meant as a punishment. That's what the legislative intent here is. Um, it's not really me meant as a path to an easy conviction for the state. Um, as stated earlier, section one starts out as a misdemeanor. So there's really no due process or concern here if someone, I'm sorry, section one starts out as a traffic infraction. So there's really no concern there that if that person did not know, did not receive notice, that they're really going to be, um, you know, uh, unfairly uh, prosecuted because you're talking about a fine. Um, but when you get to Section Five, we're talking about a felony. Um, so the legislative intent behind Five is really more a punishment. That's why it's separated out. It's not to make the path for prosecution so simple. Um, so not just because notice and knowledge aren't specifically mentioned, they're also not specifically excluded from subsection five. They don't say, they could easily put in a, a chapter in there that says, um, notwithstanding any knowledge or notice in section two, uh, notwithstanding anything in section three or four that requires notice or knowledge, they could have put that language in there specifically after Rogers uh, first established that notice is an element. Um, the legislature took no action to change section five uh, 
uh, regarding that. So they could have easily changed that. And I think that goes to show the legislative intent behind it. Council, let me, let me ask you this. Isn't there still in our law a general principle subject to some exceptions that people are charged with notice of what the law is? Like essentially that uh, lack of not notice of the law is no defense. Is that what your honor is referring right, to? Right. That we're, you know, we're chargeable with the, with the knowledge of, uh, of certain things are prohibited in, in statute. Um, certain things are required. Certain things uh, uh, happen as a result of the statutes, which is what, how the law operates. Correct. Uh, and the argument isn't that the uh, person accused uh, has knowledge of uh, what the, that it's a third degree felony or that, you know, they can be punished for this. It's that they got notice that the revocation occurred and that's. Well, but the, the law provides, the, but the law provides that if you, if you, if you check certain boxes, then you shall be a, 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 a designated a habitual traffic offender. Isn't that correct? Your Honor, it is it is mandatory, but so is the notice revocation, the notice of the revocation. I understand that. I don't understand, I understand that. But but so but I understand that there's a notice provision in there. But so isn't your isn't your client on on notice by virtue of the law that he checked those boxes and therefore he's a habitual traffic offender? Well, I think then the um, you if if you take that to that extreme is that knowledge or notice wouldn't be present in section two. You wouldn't need that either because um, if he's aware of the law that he's not supposed to have a suspended license, well, that's it, it kind of defeats the whole purpose that, of the that, notice requirement. I don't see how that follows because someone might be chargeable with a knowledge of what the law provides, but legislature might decide we're gonna take measures to, to put them on not just that constructive notice, but actual notice. Um, now I realize there are circumstances uh, in the law uh, in context where uh, the, pr the principle I've articulated has found not to, uh, to work, um, um, like for sexual registration, if I right. remember correctly. And there's some other contexts, but, uh, but that's still that overarching, I I'm just trying to understand why in, in a case like this, um, in a circumstances like this, where th this, um, uh, this uh, status is as a, a result of a, a, a series of uh, violations of the law, why, uh, and, and someone has obviously been ensnared with, uh, uh, with, the, with the law on an ongoing basis, why, why it would be unreasonable to think that they would be chargeable with knowledge of uh, that law. Well, Your Honor, all I can say is that I don't understand why then the, the, uh, the law would require this notice if if everyone's presumed to be on notice. I mean, 322.251 says notice must be sent. Um, and, you know, you wouldn't have notice and knowledge within the statute for driving when suspended under 322.34, you know, if uh, the, everyone was presumed or deemed to know all this information. Okay, I, so, I got that, I got it. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, so, as I was indicating, notice isn't, notice is required just to take effect for this, uh, revocation to even take effect. Um, and also, so can, it does go to the legislative can, intent. Can we take a shot at reading the statute in connection with 322-264, which is the definition of a habitual traffic defender? A habitual traffic offender is any person whose record as maintained by the department shows that such person has accumulated the specific number of convictions. It doesn't talk there at all about the state of mind of the habitual traffic offender or what the habitual traffic offender knows about his or her status. Wouldn't you agree that the definition of a habitual traffic offender is itself predicated on no knowledge on the part of the habitual traffic offender, but rather on what the records of the department show? Uh, the, the last part of that question, could you repeat that last part? You know, and I was trying to understand. Yeah, I, I, I heard guess the first. What I'm, what I'm asking you is, I'm a, if I'm a habitual traffic offender, the statute that defines me as such doesn't say anything about whether or not I know it. It says that I am a habitual traffic offender because of the records of the department. Wouldn't you agree?
Yeah, I mean, it doesn't say it in 322.264, but that is also a definitional uh, section of the statute. Um, you know, 322.27 well, is actually I the guess authority that's what to I'm saying, though, is that doesn't, doesn't, um, doesn't dot 34 refer us back to dot 264 in a way that requires us to read those two statutes together? That's my question. Uh, yes, they do, but I, I think it needs to be, that's too narrow just to focus on those two sections because the authority to revoke is under 322.27. And that of course gives the uh, DHSNB the right to actually revoke uh, someone's license. So even though I, I agree that 322.264 does apply and should be considered, it's, it's much too narrow. Um, so counsel, so, is it your is it your position that the designation as a habitual traffic offender doesn't attach to the person until and unless notice is sent? I believe that's in the the statute, Your Honor. Uh, that that until notice is actually provided, they don't become a habitual traffic offender. So that is part of actually the revocation process. It doesn't start. The revocation doesn't start. I don't believe it's attached to the person's driving record. Um, and that's more of the reason why if they in, intended all of this to be in there, they didn't make an exception in, in that statute, 322.251 to say, well, if they're habitual, they don't really need notice. They, they do, they still need notice for this offense. It's a third degree felony. Um, you know, and mens rea is kind of the rule, not the exception. And by not, you know, not allowing, um, the defendant to ever raise notice under this statute, um, you know, they never are able to present any kind of a defense um, that they didn't receive notice that they they were unknowingly uh, driving on this habitual um, revocation, and um, it sort of goes against that standard presumption that you should really, unless there's some explicit thing saying no, uh, no notice or knowledge, which the legislature has not done. I understand that the words are not there in section five, but when you read the statute as a whole and the uh, joining statutes in, within the chapter, uh, it's clear that the intent was to include that. And I think that it would be sort of an unreasonable uh, view of their legislative intent uh, to just assume that they did not want that. Uh, it looks like I'm done and I'll save the rest of my time for rebuttal. Thank you. Council. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court. My name is Jonathan Cannon with the Attorney General's Office uh, representing the state of Florida. Uh, Your Honors, this case presents a straightforward question of statutory interpretation. Section 322.34, subsection 5, states as follows. Any person whose driver license has been revoked pursuant to section 322.264, habitual offender, and who drives any motor vehicle upon the highways of this state while such license is revoked is guilty of a felony of the third degree. Under the plain language of the statute, there are only two elements. The first is that the person has been designated as a habitual traffic offender and that their license has been revoked accordingly. And the second is that they drive on a highway of this state while the revocation is in effect. The second district correctly looked at the statute and determined that those are the only two elements of the offense that have been uh, encoded into law by the legislature. And those are also the only two elements that appear in the standard jury instruction for the offense. The origin of the notice requirement comes from the 4th District's 2001 decision in Rogers, where the 4th District was discussing a different issue of whether in order to convict a defendant for the HTO offense, the state is required to prove each of the underlying convictions that formed the basis for the HTO designation. And in the course of discussing that issue, the 4th District said uh, that notice is one of the elements of the offense just in the context of describing the statute or describing the crime. But in its, its basis for that was a different statute, 322.251, which does state that the DHSMB has to give notice of orders of cancellation, suspension, or revocation. And it says that uh, entry shall be admissible in the courts of this state and shall constitute sufficient proof that such notice has been given. But it doesn't say anything about whether proof of that notice is an element of any specific offense in chapter 322. And when we read that uh, statute 322.34 in its totality, 
we can see that the legislature created one offense where knowledge is explicitly required as an element. That's the subsection two offense driving with a suspended or revoked license with knowledge. And if provided that one of the ways knowledge can be proven is by showing that the defendant received notice of the cancellation, suspension, or revocation. But then when we get to subsection five, the legislature didn't include that type of language. It said that an offender is guilty of the offense when their license has been revoked as an HDO and they drive while the revocation is in effect. Counsel, can I ask you the same question I asked opposing counsel? Do you think the HTO designation attaches automatically by extent of the definition that Justice Correale mentioned? Or do you think it does not attach to the person until notice is properly provided? Under the statute, I think a person is defined as an HTO just by virtue of having the underlying convictions that qualify them as an HTO. The five-year revocation, I think if we look at 322.251, does take effect 20 days after the notice has been, the fact that notice has been given has been noted on your driving record. So do you think the state could charge someone with HTO, driving as an HTO, in the time period between when the department determined that they were HTO, but not within that 20 days before the suspension took effect? I think it would depend on whether they're, possibly not, Your Honor. I think it would depend on whether their driving record shows that they're an HTO. But that goes to the question of whether they are an HTO, whether they qualify as an HTO. That's a somewhat separate question from whether notice is required as an element of the offense under the statute. I think in talking about legislative intent, we can see reasons why the legislature would have concluded that it isn't necessary to prove notice. Now, the legislature can determine that the person should be provided notice of their HTO statute. But the point of the HTO offense is that the person has been serially convicted of traffic offenses and then continues to drive. So the legislature could determine that under these circumstances, it doesn't really matter whether they're specifically aware of their HTO status or not. The fact is that they have had multiple convictions for traffic offenses, either three convictions for the specific offenses discussed in subsection one of the HTO definition and 15 violations in the second subsection. But the legislature could determine that based on this person's involvement with the Department of Highway Safety and Motor Vehicles, their involvement with the justice system. This person knows that they have serious issues with their driving record. At this point, it doesn't matter whether they've necessarily been given note, whether they've been given notice or whether the state has to prove notice or whether they're necessarily aware that they're an HTO. The problem is that they've continued to drive after being serially convicted of traffic offenses. Is it possible to receive, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Is it possible to receive HTO status based solely on driving without knowledge? Yes. If the person has received one of the qualifying offenses where only three convictions is required is where the person has received prior convictions for driving with a suspended or revoked license. Even without knowledge? I am not sure about that, Your Honor. I believe it's not necessary. I think the statute just says driving three prior convictions for driving with a suspended or revoked license, if I'm remembering correctly. So under the state's interpretation, arguably, someone could drive with license suspended without any knowledge, get their license back, have it suspended again for various financial issues, and then still perhaps get HTO status and not realize that they were driving on a criminal violation. Well, I think it's important to point out that the subsection two offense, one of the ways of proving knowledge is where the person has previously been convicted 
of driving with a suspended or revoked license under subsection one. The subsection one offense is a moving violation, essentially the first time, uh, assuming the state doesn't prove any notice, but the fact of that first conviction for all subsequent convictions serves in itself as proof that the person had knowledge. From, from all this argument, should I conclude that the state concedes that this is not a strict liability offense? Well, I think if by strict liability offense, I would define a strict liability offense as one that uh, doesn't include a notice or knowledge element. In that regard, uh, well, that, I, I think- that's, that's, candidly, that's, that's obviously too broad, right? I mean, under Rahafe versus the United States, um, you know, the, the Supreme Court has told us that, you know, when we're reading a statute, there are the uh, traditional mens rea considerations that uh, the chief was talking about not long ago, um, and that often a statute will make no mention of what the mens rea is, and yet we, the U.S. Supreme Court, many, all courts in our system know that there's a, a a mens rea requirement that sort of sleeps in the field, if you will, even if it isn't written in the statute. So it can't be that if that if it unless it says what it is, then you know we must assume it's a strict liability offense. My my question to you is: Are you conceding that this is not a strict liability offense? I, I'm still not sure I understand your question, Your Honor. Uh, can you can you define what you many, mean by many 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 types of crimes require no mens rea, because or or civil violations require no proof of knowledge, right? And those we call strict liability offenses. My question to the state is: Is this that kind of offense, or is it that because the penalties are so severe, for example, this cannot be a strict liability offense? We must establish some sort of knowledge on the part of the offender, some sort of criminal mindset or mens rea in order to convict the defendant. You know, Your Honor, I would say that this is a strict liability offense under that definition in the sense that we don't need to prove any knowledge of the person's status. Now, I think the legislature could reasonably determine that by the time a person is an HTO, they would necessarily have knowledge at the very least of their, um, their, the status of their driving record. And of course, driving is a privilege. It's not a right under state law. A person has an obligation to make sure that they are licensed to drive a motor vehicle. Uh, but the question for our purposes is, did the legislature make that an element of this offense? And under the plain language of the statute, it clearly didn't. Uh, and we can, see, even if the lack, now in some cases, the court can view the lack of a mens rea element as an ambiguity, particularly if we have, let's say, a common law offense where notice or not, or knowledge rather, some sort of mental element is an inherent element of the offense. But first of all, this is a traffic offense, which is essentially subject to legislative discretion. Secondly, even if we view the lack of notice or knowledge as an ambiguity, that ambiguity is eliminated when we read the statute as a whole. And we can see that in subsection two, the legislature expressly made notice, I'm sorry, expressly made knowledge an element of that crime. And then, uh, and then provided that one of the ways to prove knowledge is by showing that the person received notice of the revocation. When we get to subsection five, the legislature was silent, which indicates that if the legislature had wanted to make either knowledge or notice an element of the offense, it could have done that easily. Um, and of course, when you look at subsection two, it's not just that the legislature made knowledge an element, it set out a very specific uh, method and, and set out very specific ways for the state to prove that the person had knowledge. When we get to subsection five, even if we were to assume that knowledge is an element of the offense, that begs the question of, well, how does, how does the state prove that? Do we incorporate all of the provisions included in subsection two? Is it that notice was sent? Is it that the person received notice? And this was, as the second district pointed out, this wasn't a hypothetical concern. This was, this actually was a very long discussion in the trial court uh, on that basis where the defense was requesting a special jury instruction requiring the state to prove notice. And the 
parties in the trial court started looking at the subsection two standard jury instruction and trying to figure out, okay, well, if we're making, if we're making that an element, is it notice or is it knowledge? And if it's knowledge, how do we prove that? Is there a presumption like there is under subsection two? And ultimately the trial court correctly ruled, look, the statute is very clear. It doesn't include notice or knowledge as an element. The standard jury instruction doesn't include notice or knowledge as an element. And the court is obligated to apply the statute as written. And in order to hold that notice or knowledge is an element of the offense, the court would essentially have to make a legislative judgment. Is it notice or is it knowledge? Does notice have to be sent or does it have to be received? And how does the state prove that? And there's really no basis to do that in this statute, particularly where the legislature did it in a different subsection and didn't do so here. And from that, we presume that the legislature made a reasonable legislative judgment that notice and knowledge were not elements of the offense. The petitioner also discussed the legislature's failure to amend the statute in light of Rogers and Fields. As discussed in the state's answer brief, under this record, we really, I don't think can interpret anything, any intent from the legislature's failure to amend the statute. In 2007, just a couple of years after Rogers and Fields, this court adopted the standard jury instruction on the offense, which lists only two elements. Now, the standard jury instructions obviously aren't binding precedent, but they are persuasive. And I think any legislator looking at that would say, okay, well, according to the Florida Supreme Court, there are only two elements of the offense. So there's no basis for, there's no need for us to take any action. If the court has no further questions, I will rely on the state's answer brief for any further arguments. And the state requests that the decision of the second district be approved. Thank you, counsel. Rebuttal. Counsel, you are, have muted yourself. Thank you, your honor. I think I'm unmuted now. So in response, it can't be presumed that knowledge or notice are present, that the offender or the person that's charged would know of these things. This would be a strict liability crime if you are just to presume or assume that the person, that it's not an element. I would agree that respondent's correct that the trial court, the parties were discussing this issue as to how to address this. I would point out too, that it was started in Vore Dyer that jurors are asking, how can, you know, can I convict a guy that doesn't know if his license is not suspended? So obviously this is an issue that came about below. And, you know, it seems like even the jurors were kind of wondering how else can you decide it? I would disagree with his argument that, I'm sorry, respondent's argument that you would have to make a legislative judgment. It can be proved notice and knowledge. It's within the statute. It's within 322.34. So there, you know, it's explained how notice and knowledge can be proven. So it wouldn't be you're having to invent some construction on how to prove those things. It's within the statute already. As indicated, jury instructions are not binding. They do change. The legislature was on notice based on from Rogers in 2001 and fields after that. And the legislature chose not to make any changes. So I would say that has a better impact on the legislative intent. Do we know, do we know that they received that notice? We're talking about from the opinions. That's a joke counsel. Thank you, your honor. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's presumed, but yes. So the plain meaning here would be unreasonable and clearly contrary to the legislative intent. It could lead to an absurd result. We've got a third degree felony where the person has no knowledge or notice. The state should be required to prove that. It's preferable. In fact, it's, it's, there are only limited circumstances where you want to remove a mens rea and it needs to be expressed or implied. There's got to be some indication why they want to remove mens rea. And there's no indication why the legislature would want to exclude notice and have a person unknowingly convicted of a third degree felony. It would be inconsistent with, with 
the fact that there's been no change to Section 5 in light of Rogers, and that mandatory notice is required for the offense. It could lead to an anomalous result. You have to prove notice for a second degree misdemeanor, uh, but you, uh, you have to prove knowledge for a second degree misdemeanor, but nothing for a third degree felony. Um, so notice and knowledge, or at least notice, is inherent to this offense. It comports with the legislature's intent and due process. Um, the purpose of notice, as I may have indicated already, sorry if I'm repeating myself, but notice is to notify someone of something. It's not just to say we've put something in the mail. It's not just a little uh, ministerial act. It's to notify someone that that, that license was revoked. The second, the second district court of appeal said that Mr. Robinson had been convicted of driving with a suspended or revoked license on 21 prior occasions, eight of which were felonies. And four times the Department of Motor Vehicle had designated him with a, as a habitual traffic offender and revoked his license accordingly. At no time did he ever attempt to reinstate his driver's license. Is, are those facts correct? Your Honor, I, I, I don't have anything specific to say that they're incorrect. I mean, yeah, I don't know if he made any attempts, but yes, clearly those convictions are there. There was nothing in the record to indicate that they were um, reinstated. So well, to answer your question, I don't have anything that says it was reinstated. What seems absurd to me, you're, you're making an absurd type argument. What seems absurd to me is an argument that he had no notice and had no knowledge. The issue is really comes down to that he's got to have notice that he's an HTO, that he actually has to receive some notice. Um, we're talking about a third degree felony. The person should be made aware at least that, look, your license has been revoked as a habitual traffic offender and uh, he should have provided some notice. And it may have been a lot easier, you know, it can vary from case to case, whether it, what the state can use to present evidence of notice and knowledge. Um, and so that may factor in based on the record uh, in individual cases, but it is an element, notice is an element. Um, I would just point out real quick, I'm going to have to rely on my brief for the second issue, but essentially that um, if this court doesn't reverse on issue one, um, that Mr. Robinson would be entitled to a new trial. There was, um, they brought in basically evidence to show prior convictions, prior knowledge, consciousness of guilt, um, and what he was not allowed to argue notice or knowledge. So the state was able to argue those things and he was not able to argue anything in response. Um, in this case, the state failed to prove notice and element. The evidence was insufficient. This court should reverse the decision in the Second District Court of Appeal and discharge Mr. Robinson's conviction or in the alternative, reverse for a new trial. Thank you. Well, thank you. We thank you both for your arguments in this case today. The court will now take a recess of about 10 minutes before we proceed to the consideration of our third case.
Good morning, Judge. Uh, my name is Philip Massa. I represent Michael Bargo. I'd like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal. Your Honor, this is a Hearst resentencing case. It was before this court, uh, before Ms. Lennon was the attorney. Uh, and during the deliberation, the court's deliberation, Hearst came along. So it was sent back down for another penalty phase trial uh, in which uh, Mr. Bargo was uh, found guilty of two severe aggravators. Uh, and after the Spencer hearing, uh, Judge Tati uh, signed a sentencing order uh, for death, for death penalty. So it's back on that appeal. And what I'd like to do, uh, it's, a, it's a big case and there's a lot of issues, but I'd like to boil it down to four issues I'd like the court to review today. One of them is a proportionality argument. The other one I'm gonna to touch on is the mental mitigation argument. The next one is uh, hack, one of the aggravators I, I believe was misapplied. And then the other one is the notice requirement uh, for seeking death. Uh, I believe there's some problems with that and I'll get into them in detail, Your Honor. So first, the proportionality argument. I know Lawrence, during the briefing of this case, uh, Lawrence was decided, uh, wherein this court held that uh, it's, it's not required anymore uh, due to the conformity clause of the Florida Constitution to do a comparative proportionality, which would be comparing case to case. It's my argument today that Lawrence, nor any case, has touched on the relative proportionality or the relative culpability uh, of the individual defendants uh, in, in this case. And that's important because Mr. Bargo was the only person sentenced to death. Two of them legally could not be sentenced to death because of their age. One pled, two went to trial and were found guilty and given life sentences. So just a, a brief, real brief fact so the court knows what, where we're coming from. Uh, five young people, two were actually juveniles, uh, seduced one of their friends uh, to come into a house. There was a, a vendetta. Uh, this poor young man, Mr. Jackson, was beaten, shot. And then after that, his body was uh, burned, mutilated, and thrown into a, a quarry. Now, I'm arguing that Lawrence did not address relative proportionality. And if the Florida Constitution is going to conform with the federal cases, then it has to recognize uh, relative proportionality because two of the most important cases out there, it's still good law, is Edmund versus Florida and Tyson versus Arizona. Those are federal cases where the issue of relative proportionality was looked at. Now, in terms of Florida cases, it's gone through kind of a rocky road. Uh, the first major case. Counsel, if I could just. Before you, before you, before you get into the case law, um, isn't it pretty clear here that, uh, or isn't there evidence uh, that would support the conclusion um, that your client was the ringleader in this uh, murder? I'm going to say respectfully, no, that's. That's kind of the buzz that went around, and that came about because of the testimony of the other co-defendants. The, and there was no empirical evidence to show that Mr. Well, but, you know, their testimony is record evidence. Exactly. I, I, said, I understand you may have a different take on it. You might want to argue that that wasn't so, but it, now my question was, is there evidence in the record to support the, that conclusion? And can you tell me that there's not record evidence to su support the conclusion that he was the ringleader? There's testimony from the other co-defendants that he was the ringleader. Now, if you look at law, if you look at Lawrence, there's empirical evidence there because in Lawrence, he actually wrote down what he was going to do. He actually wrote down which, excuse my, excuse me, body part he was going to cut out. He actually wrote down to bring coolers and scaffolds. And that menu was discovered by law enforcement. Counsel, do you agree that this whole, the argument that you're about to lay out, do you agree that if, if in fact the record supported the notion that your client was the ringleader, that really, even if we were going to go down this relative co-defendant uh, 
culpability, proportionality thing, if in fact the defendant who's making that argument was the ringleader, that whatever you're about to talk about really wouldn't apply, that your whole argument depends on us first kind of factually accepting the premise that he wasn't the ringleader. Well, ringleader, you know, that's a term of art, but I could tell the court that every other co-defendant contributed significantly in their own way to this killing. But if we, putting aside the, you know, quibbling about what, what a ringleader is, if the person was sort of the driving force, the principal sort of, you know, actor here, then do you agree that the, that the culpability argument that you're making kind of goes out the window? No, I don't, Judge, and, and okay. I'll, I'll lay it out why. Okay. So even if, he, even if it was his idea, let's say, okay, uh, two of the actors, Miss Charlie Ely and Miss um, uh, Miss Wright, two of those actors were uh, fundamentally responsible and principally responsible for seducing Mr. Jackson to the home where he was murdered. Miss Wright sent Mr. Jackson text messages. Uh, Miss Ely supplied the location for the murder. Miss Ely supplied the fire pit. She, uh, they dug it on her property to where they could uh, burn Mr. Bargo's body. And I apologize for some of these graphic descriptions. But those two uh, young girls uh, seduced him into the, the, the trailer. And when he was in there, Mr. Soto and Mr. Hooper attacked him. And Mr. Jackson escaped, but they ran after him and they tackled him. That's when he was shot first. And then he was drugged back into the trailer. And with the help of uh, Soto and Hooper, Mr. Bargo was able to, uh, the testimony says, put him in a bathtub, uh, break his legs and shoot him in the face. But those two men- doesn't, doesn't that sequence of events actually show that this was, that he was the, he was the captain of, of these events. Well, They're, they run down and uh, they run him down in the yard and, and take him back in and deliver him to your client. But it doesn't end there, Judge. What happens then Mr. Soto- It ended Mr. pretty much there. Well, then Mr. Soto and Mr. Hooper bring out uh, Mr. Mr. Jackson, uh, put him in the fire pit, uh, and burn him, uh, dismember him, and eventually shovel his ashes into a bucket and dispose of him. So they're all, they're all culpable I would say to the same extent. They all had bad roles in, in this event. Counsel, can, can we just, as I see this, I, I think the, the ringleader debate is kind of a red herring. At, at the end of the day, if the state has proven the HAC aggregator, I think the statute sets out for us, you know, the, it, as long as there's a, 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 an aggravator that's proven to the jury beyond a reasonable doubt, I think, you know, we know what the outcome of the case is. And to that point, leaving aside all of the um, uh, you know, conduct after the victim had passed away, isn't it just simply true that your client waited for him to wake up in a bathroom so that he would know who killed him uh, because your client wanted the victim to know that it was he, your client, who was shooting him in the face and delivering the final blow? Isn't that enough to, to set up and, and conclusively sort of establish for the jury the HAC aggravator? Hey, Judge, I'm going to jump then to my HAC argument. This, this kind of leads into it. Um, trial counsel objected, rightfully, that the jury should not hear about what happened to Mr. Jackson's body after he was murdered uh, because of the potential spillover effect. Now, the method of the shooting, the prolongedness of the shooting, all that, does qualify as HAC. Case law says that. But where the problem is, is I would say most of the, I mean, what's more heinous, the shooting of somebody or the burning and, and, and disposal of the body? Well, that's, that, that's not really my question. I think I heard an answer to my question, which is you believe the HAC aggravator is in fact established by Mr. Bargo's conduct in awaiting for the victim to come to just enough to see who it was who was going to shoot him again, that is your client. 
am I am I correct that you're conceding then that on that basis, leaving aside everything else, the HAC aggravator is established? That's what the case law says. Sir. But where the problem is, there's a spillover effect because the jury heard what happened to the body after it was disposed of. Now we don't know what the jury came back with the HAC for. Did they think the shooting was the HAC? Did they get it mixed up with what happened post death with the body? There's a confusion there. And there's a case right on point and it's a uh, Jones versus State. And in Jones versus State, and I'll read the site, it's 569 Southern 2nd, 1234, Florida, 1990. They say you can't consider post death actions for HAC. Well, if you can't consider post death actions for HAC, the jury should never have heard that because the jury could be confused. We well, don't. But, but counsel, it, but it, it's relevant to this uh, CCP. Isn't that correct? And, and, it, and did, you, did you properly get, or did uh, trial counsel properly get this teed up uh, for the argument you're now making? with an instruction that they should not consider it uh, to the jury, that they should not consider um, uh, that evidence with, uh, uh, on the issue of HAC, but it was uh, properly uh, to be considered on the issue of CCP. She didn't address that. She didn't object to CCP. All right. In my reading of the, of the transcript. I read it the same way. But we don't know, and, and here's the, the pepper. We don't know uh, why HAC came back. The jury could have been confused on that. And we don't know if that influenced them on the CCP also, because the post-death facts are horrible. You know, allegedly Mr. Bargo took the skull out of the charred pit and pulled out the man's teeth. So that could have inflamed the jury completely. And that could have also had a spillover effect into CCP. Those facts alone, uh, I would say, warrant a new penalty trial. Uh, so I'm going to move on from that, Your Honor, unless you want to hear some more on the HAC aggravator. Because I'm, I'm arguing that that's one of the reasons why he should get a new trial. Because you don't know what's more horrible, uh, shooting him, torturing him, or placing the body in a sleeping bag, cremating him pulling out his teeth, shoveling his ashes into a bucket, throwing it into a pit. The jury heard all that. And in the Jones court, when Jones reversed it, they say that the error there was not harmless. It's a place, you know, it was not harmless error uh, when the jury heard that. And that's my concern is that it could have affected both aggravators. So that's why on that point, I would ask for a new penalty trial. On the proportionality issue, I would ask for a life sentence uh, based on the fact that uh, in my reading of it, you know, people testify, they put it on Mike, you know, and there's, there's some testament, there's some evidence in the record that they were overheard saying that, let's put it on Mike, you know. Uh, but when you look at those actors, individual functions, they can, I mean, they were just as bad as Parker. I mean, look at uh, Wright and uh, Ely, they bring them over. And if you look at the sentences, Ely is out of prison. She got a life sentence and she did nine years on. Soto took a plea. He's doing life. Uh, Walker went to trial. She's doing life. And Vargo uh, is obviously on, on death row. Well, now the, 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 the distinction, correct me if I'm wrong, but the distinction, one distinction um, with the other two defendants you've mentioned is that they were juveniles. Is that correct? Right, they, they're not, they're not in the mix. They, weren't, they were never eligible for the death penalty. Right. right, they're not in the mix. So, and then as far as proportionality, I'm uh, respectfully arguing today that, um, you know, the relative proportionality situation in Florida, I don't think is on solid ground right now because um, it started out with Sharif versus State and then uh, McLeod came in and said that, you know, everybody doesn't have to be similarly situated as, as long as they're all part of a, a culpable act. And then Jeffries came in and kind of went back to the Sharif thinking. And there was even a comment, I think, by Justice Parenti, is are we overruled, did McLeod overrule Sharif? And then Lawrence came 
and said no proportion, no comparative proportionality, but it never mentioned anything about relative proportionality. And the case law that Lawrence relied on, which is Pulley versus Harris, I, I read that and they mentioned comparative proportionality 20 times and they mentioned relative proportionality zero times. So a uh, successful relative proportionality argument could get Mr. Bargo a life sentence. And that's my argument on that. So I think right now, I mean, my my reading of this right now is uh, relative proportionality is alive and well in the federal courts, but uh, it's I'm not sure if it's uh, on all fours in, in Florida yet, because there's no case after Lawrence that I found that deals with relative proportionality. Well, I think this one will. Um, <laughs> All right, and uh, uh, oh, you are you are now in your uh, you are now in your rebuttal time. You may continue. I just wanted to uh, give you a head. And then the other thing I wanted to to address, we did HAC, we did relative proportionality. The other thing I wanted to address was the mental mitigation in this case, and uh, I'm not going to go through all thousand pages of doctor's testimony, but I did do a spreadsheet. And the three main mental health experts, Dr. Wu, who's a medical doctor, Dr. Eisenstein's a PhD, and Dr. Berlin, each, they all came up or combined came up with 16 mental health conditions, ranging from hyperactivity to schizophrenia to uh, delusional paranoia, delusional paranoid thinking to brain injury and to an emotional quotient of 14 or 15 years old. So there is some severe mental problems with this man. And uh, last time it was in front of just this court, and I'm paraphrasing Judge Parenti, uh, Parenti she, even, she even said that, you know, someone with this much mental mitigation would not qualify for the death penalty. And no one had a chance to rule on this because it went back for, for you know, resentencing another penalty case. And the other thing I wanted to address in the mental mitigation there was a disconnect between the trial judge and the experts on two important issues. Dr. Eisenstein said that he had, the defendant, had an emotional quotient of 14 or 15 years old, which is very important. In other words, he was thinking like a 14 or 15 year old. And the court asked him, do you have any specific tests to show me? Are there any specific tests? And what Dr. Eisenstein said was, there's no test per se, okay? What you do is you look at um, the norm, in terms of normal maturation, thought processes, behavior. That's what you look at to get to this point. And the court took that as, and I'll quote, in his sentencing order, he said that he conceded there was no test to determine a person's emotional quotient. The court considers his opinions on the subject to be entirely subjective and closer to a guess. And I think that was an important misconnect there because that wasn't a guess by that expert. It was just, a, I think, a misunderstanding. And the other part, uh, when it came to uh, Dr. Eisenstein's knowledge of the case, he was very knowledgeable of the facts. And when the prosecutor was cross-examining him, the prosecutor was giving him ultimatum facts, like, isn't this true? This is what happened. And Dr. Eisenstein said, I don't know if that's true. There were many actors, many things could have happened. He wasn't gonna commit himself. And the court took that as the doctor not knowing what the case was about. And that affected, that affected the, uh, the outcome because the court said, Eisenstein's opinions significantly diminished, are significantly diminished by his admitted lack of knowledge. That's not correct. Dr. Eisenstein knew about the case, and, but the court viewed the mental mitigation from this important witness as someone who didn't know about the case and it impacted the court's thinking on it. And that's on page 15 of the sentencing order. And the other thing I quoted would be on page 12 of the sentencing. Now, I don't know if I'm out of time. I got one more, uh, but I, I think I argued it pretty well in the briefs. So if I don't have time.
I'm back. You, you have now um, essentially exhausted all your time. Okay. But I will nonetheless afford you two minutes for rebuttal. Thank you, Jeff. The other one is the notice requirement. But you're done now. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> you get two for rebuttal, but that's it. Okay. On the way back. Thank you. All right. When you come back. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Council for the state. May it please the court, Doris Meacham, Office of the, uh, the Attorney General. I'm here on behalf of the state. I'd like to start with the relative proportionality argument. Um, I believe that once the comparative proportionality analysis was done with, so was relative. Uh, it's a corollary of the comparative analysis. And I believe in the cloud, Justice Kennedy stated that, that once uh, relative proportionality was a corollary of comparative. One goes, the other one goes as well. And if you were to compare the actions of everyone in here, clearly Fargo was the most culpable. He was the ringleader. He came up with the plan. Seth Jackson would be alive if it wasn't for Fargo. He was the actual shooter in this. He assigned roles to everyone. He's the one that decided what to do with the body. He came up with the idea to do the fire pit, to burn the body. He came up with the idea to put the body into the paint cans. He came up with the idea to take it to the rock quarry and get rid of it afterwards. Everything points to Vargo being the one instigating this. The fact that he was able to convince four other individuals into helping him shows that he was the ringleader. Uh, during the crime, one of them did not do what they were supposed to do, and he stepped in and he changed things and he made things happen. It's clearly from the record that Vargo is the most culpable in this case. Well, and Counsel, again, if, we, if we agree with you on that uh, factual point, um, and what the record demonstrates on those facts, um, we don't really need to get into uh, the issue of whether uh, relative uh, uh, proportionality, culpability survives uh, Lawrence. Uh, right. That's just, we leave that for another day where it would, yeah. would, would matter. Because here it doesn't matter. If, even if we accept that it does survive, uh, the, state, the state would prevail on uh, based on the facts. I will move on to the HAC argument that Defense Counsel made. Now, on this, he compares this case to Jones. In Jones, the evidence that was argued was what happened to the victim afterwards was that she was sexually assaulted. That fact was not relevant to anything going towards HAC or CCP. In our case, the fact that the body was burned is extremely relevant to the CCP factor mitigator in this case. And in the closing arguments, the prosecutor was very clear when he stated what established HAC and what established CCP. And the only time he spoke about the CCP, the burning of the body was during CCP. So it was very clear to the jury when they were listening what the HAC was. And the HAC is abundant in this case. This wasn't just a shooting death, this was an ambush. He was lured to the house under the assumption that he was going to talk to his ex-girlfriend that he still cared about. And he gets there being told that it's just gonna be them, Vargo's not gonna be there. He sits down on the couch and he sees Vargo. At that moment, he knew what was gonna happen, that things were gonna go bad, and they did. He was attacked, beaten up in the living room, shot. He managed to get away, get up, run through the kitchen, make it outside where they followed him. So for a brief moment, he thought he was free, and that just went away when they tackled him, beat him up, shot him again, brought him back into the house, into the bathtub, because as Fargo stated, I want him to see my face when I kill him, when I shoot him. And that's what happened. So th there is plenty of HAC in this case, and there's no confusion as to why the jury came up with that. As far as the mental mitigation in this case, even the defense experts were all over the place as to what the uh, defendant was actually suffering from. And in the court order, the, the, the trial judge acknowledged that yes, he had been diagnosed with several things in the past, but what he didn't quite 
agree with was whether or not he was suffering from any of these. And defense counsel mentioned uh, Dr. Wu about a, a head injury, and he had a complex seizure spectrum disorder, which the state's experts said doesn't even exist. And neither did this head injury. The only evidence of a head injury was when Bargo was 17. He fell in the shower and was taken to the ER. And out of precaution, they ran a CT scan, which came back negative. He got some stitches. He was sent home. There was no evidence to tie any of the diagnosis to what happened on the night of the murder. You know, he wasn't disorganized. He wasn't suffering from anything. He wasn't erratic. Everything points to this being a very organized, very planned murder from beginning to end. And the only doctor that was really able to explain the behavior was Dr. Pritchard. And he diagnosed him with oppositional defiant disorder. And that's a personality disorder. It's not a mental illness. It's something that he lives with. It's something that he could deal with, with therapy, not medication, no drugs. In fact, the last five years he was in DOC, he's been seen by uh, mental staff and no one has diagnosed him with any kind of mental ailments. He's not on any prescription drugs. He's not under any kind of mental uh, abnormality. He is suffering from a personality disorder. As doctors evaluated him when he was younger and he was going through a divorce with his parents, he is defiant. He does not want to be told what to do. He's angry. And that is basically the sum of this. He did not like Jackson because he liked Amber Wright and he wanted to be done with him. He wanted to kill him. This was thought out, well-planned, not any emotional disturbance. He knew his conduct that day. So the state would ask that you would affirm his conviction and sentence because he is guilty of the crime. It was premeditated and he meets the criteria for the death penalty. Thank you. Any questions? I would reserve my or be done with this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, counsel. All right, now we'll have your two minute rebuttal. Thank you, Judge. Well, as far as relative proportionality, it's going to have to survive because if the court says relative proportionality is part of comparative proportionality and prohibits that, then it's my argument you're going to run into problems with Edmund versus Florida and Tyson versus Arizona because the federal case law, the federal courts interpreting the federal constitution recognize relative proportionality. Now, counsel, I just, and I'm sorry to eat, in, into, eat into your rebuttal time. I just want to make sure you're, we're clear that there's a difference between relative culpability and any relative proportionality of the death sentence. Are, are you able, do you agree that those are two different concepts? Yes, Judge. They, they kind of, you know, they, they blend them though in the opinion. They flip back and forth a little bit. But, you know, the comparative proportionality is, you know, the universal comparison of other death cases. And then the relative uh, proportionality is the microcosm, how each actor, what is, what is their culpability in, in, the, in, the, in the case. So my, my, I only got a minute left, but I'm saying if, if you say that relative proportionality is going to be is a subset of comparative proportionality, then we have to answer to uh, Edna versus Florida and Tyson versus Arizona. The other thing, uh, as far as the mental mitigation, I mean, that's all the battle of the experts. I mean, that's all that was. The, the important person there is the court. Uh, the court makes the determination. And I argue that in two important points, the emotional quotient, the 14 to 15 year old, and Dr. Eisenstein's knowledge of the case, with all due respect, the trial court didn't get it right. And that affected the trial court's uh, you know, analysis. Now, everybody got hung up on whether or not those mental processes were working at the time of the killing. Uh, the last thing is hack. I'll argue it again. Um, what happened to the body influence? We have no way of knowing that didn't influence. All right, counsel, uh, you, you have now exhausted the additional time that I afforded to you. So I want to thank um, both of you for your arguments in this case and the court will now uh, prepare to take up our final case on today's docket.
Now proceeds to the final case on today's docket, the case of Morris versus the state. Council. Good morning, your honors. Chief Justice, your honors, and may it please the court. My name is Adriana Corso, and along with co-counsel represent the appellant, Mr. Dante Morris. Your honors, this case presents before the court this morning, following the post-conviction court's denial of Mr. Morris's Rule 3851 motion, which was denied following an evidentiary hearing on all claims alleged by Mr. Morris, except for one. And your honor, respectfully, the appellant directs the court's attention to that similarly denied claim, specifically claim five of the appellant's initial brief. Your honors, Mr. Morris was not provided a fair trial and has not been given the opportunity to show that. It was not until the post-conviction proceedings that the only direct evidence of Mr. Morris's psychosis was able to be obtained and reviewed by any member of defense counsel. And therefore, your honor, the respect, the appellant respectfully requests this court remand this case back to the post-conviction court because it erred summarily denying Mr. Morris's Brady claim for two reasons. First, this is a legally cognizable claim during the post-conviction proceedings because the majority of the fact comprising Mr. Morris's claim could not have been discovered until this stage of the process. And second, your honor, Mr. Morris has alleged that the legally and facially sufficient claim and pursuant to Florida Rule of Criminal Procedure 3.851, excuse me, A1, AI, he is entitled to an evidentiary hearing. Now, your honor, turning to first the court's error in finding that this was simply a pretrial issue. Now, your honors, the facts that Mr. Morris has alleged could not have been discovered until the post-conviction proceedings in order to truly establish this as the Brady violation that it is. Your honors, it was not until the post-conviction proceedings that first, upon review of the record, just as background, upon review of the record, it was several times on the record notice that defense counsel was attempting to view specific jail visit videos pretrial that had prompted Mr. Morris's direct observation status, a 10-day direct observation, and thereby triggered competency concerns. And Mr. Heilman on the record was having difficulty obtaining and opening this video as late as February of 2013. And it was not until the post-conviction proceeding that upon review of the record, this specific video, this November 10, 2011 video was not found. And therefore, post-conviction counsel filed a 3852. Counsel, I'm having trouble with understanding why, based on what you've said, this is not in the category of a matter that should have been raised in conjunction with the trial. And then if it wasn't properly resolved there, it would have been a direct appeal issue. Well, your honor, it was not known until following the direct appeal upon receipt of the state attorney's notes that the state was able to view a working version of this video and that no other entity out. But he knew that he couldn't, he knew he was having trouble. And it seems like to me the burden was on the counsel to work through that and figure it out and not just kind of throw up his hands. And then, oh, well, somebody else could figure it out later. And now I know. I mean, that just seems to me to be kind of fanciful. Well, your honor, and there's, and I have two answers to that question. First, we have pled in the alternative that Mr. Heilman was ineffective for failing to obtain this video. And second, your honor, the two can exist simultaneously. And the reason being is that Mr. Heilman was on the record per an email that he and state attorney, Mr. Heilman, or I'm sorry, Mr. Harmon exchanged as late as 2013 requesting this video. The final correspondence between the two, and that is the last evidence we have in the record of this exchange, states that Mr. Heilman was sending his investigators an amended notice of discovery had been filed, an additional 154 jail visits had been noted, and the investigator was going with 160 disks in order to obtain the additional 154 videos and the six videos that were unable to open pretrial. Now, your honors, there is no evidence in the record that even if Mr. Heilman had gone himself to Mr. Harmon's computer and downloaded this, that it would have been a working version. And so we have an issue here that that 
titled 1110-2011 video never left the state attorney's office in working version, and not just to the defense counsel, Your Honor. It also didn't work for competency doctors. Dr. Taylor noticed in his competency evaluation that this specific November 10th, 2011 video was inaudible. And Your Honors, this was the specific video that had Mr. Morris's psychotic break, direct evidence of it that was unable to previously been reviewed by defense experts, by defense counsel, or by any competency doctors in this case, Your Honor. And that is why here, and it is also in the post-conviction proceedings and why this is a, a post-conviction cognizable claim. It was also in the post-conviction proceedings that for the first time from the Tampa Police Department file sent from the repository that a video titled November 21st, 2011 with a special notation mother's visit that is not included on any other saved video file name in the TPD's file that was saved several days prior to actually that November 21st date was in fact, and has been stipulated to by the state to be that November 10th, 2011. So the question even of whether or not defense team received that now working version of the video, which is the first time it's been able to be reviewed is first a question of fact that must be resolved for an evidentiary hearing. And second, a fact that could not have otherwise been known. So we, what we do know now is that that November 10th, 2011 video, regardless of whether or not Mr. Heilman was ineffective in following up again, even though he attempted three times on the record an email exchange and sent his investigator with additional tapes to receive this. And we have Mr. Heilman now states that he never, he still has not seen a working version of this. It was never received by defense counsel. And your honors, that is why this is not a retrial issue that should have been raised pursuant to a Richardson hearing and should not have properly been denied by Taylor v. State because this is a Brady issue cognizable in post-conviction consisting of facts and arguments that were only found discovered and could have been discovered during post-conviction. And because these genuine questions of fact exist, particularly regarding disclosure of whether or not following that exchange, whether that, that working disc was ever sent again to, to Mr. Heilman, whether that 1121 specially notated mother's visit was ever sent to defense counsel. Those are both questions of fact, Your Honor, that require an evidentiary hearing based on the precedent of this court. This court has found in Freeman v. State that if it is not conclusively refuted by the record, Your Honor, it must be, it, an evidentiary hearing must be held. And that is why turning to the second issue in that Mr. Morris has alleged a legally and facially sufficient um, claim under Brady v. Maryland. Now, first, um, this, this video again, and, you know, especially discussing these two separate videos, the question of whether or not this is disclosed is a question of fact. And it seems here from the evidence, it does not seem as though this working November 21st missaved now stipulated to video was ever disclosed. It seems as though only this not working version was disclosed again to the defense and to competency doctors. Now, Your Honor, during the post conviction proceedings, post conviction counsel uh, retained and showed trial expert uh, Dr. Valerie McLean this video. Now, Dr. McLean had previously been given direct observation notes. Um, she had been given, uh, you know, interviews with Mr. Morris, but not until this time had she ever seen direct evidence that has changed her, her opinion that instead of a, a diagnosis of manic depressant with some psychotic features, which she did not believe could rebut the state's antisocial personality disorder diagnosis and counseled defense counsel that she should not testify during the penalty phase in front of the jury because of that diagnosis, that had she seen that video, that Dr. McLean would have explored a more serious psychotic disorder diagnosis such as schizophrenia, which is precludes a diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder. Therefore, your honors, this material, this, this evidence, and this brings me into the materiality prong as well, which is a question of law and fact, and again, still does need an evidentiary hearing in order to be determined. It impacted the penalty phase. It impacted the jury hearing any testimony about any of Mr. Morris's mental illness. And it also impacted the guilt phase because this court in Morris v. State found that the trial court erred uh, not allowing mental health evidence to be admitted during trial to put Mr. Morris's mental state in context when he made the statement, I repent for killing. Now, again, the reason that this video is so important 
is because this jail visit occurred on the day that Mr. Morris was placed under a 10-day direct observation. It was during that 10-day direct observation that Mr. Morris made that statement. During trial, trial counsel only cross-examined the testifying officer on his ability to recall, his ability to how far away he was, whether or not he was able to understand him clearly. Now, this court found that it was error for the court not to allow this specific sort of evidence, Your Honor, would have absolutely put that statement into context for the jury, and it would have allowed for the jury to understand that this was, even under the court's ruling at the time, which this court found to be error, that this evidence still could have been used because it was an expert testimony. This video is of such fundamental importance. It has, it has permeated through the guilt and the penalty phase of this trial, Your Honor, and that is why an evidentiary hearing is required in this case. Now, Your Honor, as well, it's, it is not just, um, it is, it is also based on case law that especially, for example, the state argues and, and the post-conviction court found that this video was disclosed. However, that is simply not the case. Uh, a non-working version was disclosed in the amended notice of discovery. There is evidence in the record, trial counsel making notes on that amended notice that they were unable to open it. And this court even held in wavy state, Your Honors, it, that, that as a matter of law, a finding of disclosure is inconsistent with Brady where the state has affirmatively represented that all the photographs of the crime scene have been produced. Here, the state has affirmatively represented, especially based on Mr. Heilman's last email and all of the um, amended notices that all of the jail visits had been produced. And Your Honor, it is not in the record that that November 21, 2011 video has been produced. Simply, it's in the record that that video in particular does not work. It has changed defense counsel and it prejudiced Mr. Morris, especially, Your Honor, in light of all of the other evidence that was put on by post-conviction counsel to challenge every aspect of the state's case. And this is in comparison to what trial counsel put on during trial, Your Honors, which was nothing. No witness, no testimony. The, the, the trial attorney did not challenge any component of the state's case while here, Post-conviction counsel has challenged every affirmative representation that the state has put forth of why Mr. Moore should be guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. First, testimony of Ashley Price. Not only do we have counsel being ineffective for not um, bringing out in front of the jury that she was um, having custody issues, she currently did not have her children with her at the time of her testimony, that she was facing eviction, that her financial situation was so dire that she was unable to make her monthly payments it's a month following her getting wrapped up in TPD's manhunt, looking for Mr. Morris and any witnesses that may have information. Now, your honors, this newly discovered evidence by James Baird is admissible evidence, and it is not something that could have previously been discovered. Mr. Baird testified that he and Ashley could not have come forward with this because of the legal issues and the pressure being put on them by the state prior to this point. Those both in conjunction would have um, would have challenged the credibility of Ashley Price. Additionally, Mr. Morris's statement, I repent for killing, had this video evidence been produced, that could have been put into context and the jury could have understood that it just wasn't an affirmative statement of murder. It was actually a rambling of a man who made other comments such as giving his family AIDS and, and other sorts of off the wall comments, Your Honor, that, that have no bearing and are truly the ramblings of an individual who is unwell and the jury should have understood this. Your Honor, the eyewitness identification could have been challenged by Mr. Oglesby, which, who, who was called to testify during the post-conviction proceeding, wearing, who, who saw Mr. Morris very recent prior to the, more, to the murder and was not wearing um, the vest described by Tamika Jones and seen in the video and instead had on a necklace and was in a different color car. Now, Your Honor, Ms. Brantley, we know, never named the driver in the vehicle that evening. No DNA evidence was found in the car belonging to Mr. Morris. And the cell phone records admitted by the state, in fact, included a third cell phone number, which could have actually been the individual in the car, explaining why Mr. Morris instructed Ms. Brantley to move the car. And finally, Your Honor, and most importantly, especially with the emphasis that the state placed on this, in that Mr. Morris giving his identification to officers Curtis and Coquette that evening is, is, not, is not soundproof evidence that it was him, especially because 
evidence was available to trial counsel. In fact, we were able to present this evidence based on information found in trial counsel's file. We were able to find that Mr. Morris had three worthless checks passed prior with someone using his Florida identification card containing his name, date of birth. They were cashed inside Publix, broad daylight. If the Publix check cashier thought that that was Mr. Morris, it is likely that the officers in the dark could have made the same mistake that had been previously made on four separate occasions. Counsel, you are uh, now moving into your rebuttal time. Um, I yes, want you, you can keep going. Don't count on my extending, however. No. <laughs> we have not asked you many questions, and so. <laughs> I, yeah. I appreciate it, and I will, and Your Honor here, and I will briefly conclude too, and with this last component of the state's case, for this court to consider that Brady evidence that's been suppressed, how post-conviction counsel has been able to put forth a case that should have and could have been put forth, put forth by trial counsel, and that video's impact in Mr. Morris's penalty phase warrant him either an evidentiary hearing on his Brady claim or this court finding that Mr. Morris is entitled to a new guilt phase and penalty phase of his trial. Thank you. Thank you. Counsel? Good morning. May it please the court. My name is Marilyn Becky and I represent the state of Florida. The lower court's order in this case denying post conviction relief is based in large part on credibility determinations that the court made after the evidentiary hearing. The denial of both the newly discovered evidence claim and most of the ineffective assistance of counsel claims turn on these credibility determinations. There is uh, competent substantial evidence in the record supporting each of those findings. Additionally, the lower court properly determined that even if the evidence, newly discovered evidence had been presented or any of these alleged deficiencies didn't exist, it wouldn't have changed the result of the guilt phase or the penalty phase of Mr. Morris's trial for these two highly aggravated murders. Um, with respect to the Brady claim, it was properly, properly summarily denied. The crux of a Brady claim is that the state has suppressed evidence. If the defendant is provided with the evidence, it has not been suppressed. Uh, the state did disclose the, uh, the videos along with another, uh, a number of other uh, recordings of various jail record uh, visits that Mr. Morris had. More importantly, uh, Mr. Heilman knew exactly what was on that video. He was the one who was contacted by Mr. Morris's mother, who was concerned about Mr. Morris's behavior during that particular visit, which is what resulted in hiring Dr. McLean initially for a uh, competency evaluation, and then she's eventually retained for uh, mitigation. So there is no facts that we need to uh, further explore with, re with respect to the Brady claim, because the evidence was uh, revealed, it was not suppressed, uh, counsel knew what was on there, and it wouldn't have resulted in a different verdict regardless. To address the impact that that video had or did not have on uh, Dr. McLean's testimony, we need to know what Dr. McLean actually said at the post-conviction hearing. And what she said was not, I diagnosed Mr. Morris with schizophrenia. What she says is that after viewing the video, she may, the symptoms may be more related to a psychotic disorder such as schizophrenia, that her conversations with defense counsel might have been a little different, that maybe they should explore uh, schizophrenia or another psychotic disorder more. Um, her concerns about competency maybe were a little different, but she never committed to diagnosing Mr. Morris with schizophrenia. And there's a very good reason for that. There's absolutely no evidence in any record, either on direct appeal or in post-conviction, that Mr. Morris suffers from schizophrenia. He's never been diagnosed with schizophrenia. Dr. McLean testifies that the psychotic symptoms that she saw initially resolved, that does not happen with schizophrenia. Uh, Dr. McLean never testified that her concern about the state rebutting that type of evidence with an antisocial personality disorder or narcissistic personality disorder diagnosis was any different. And the state would have done exactly that. This is classic double-edged sword type of mitigation. It's not mitigating at all. In fact, it is aggravating. The state did rebut any allegation that Mr. Morris might suffer from a mental disorder by putting on evidence of Dr. Lazaro, 
The post-conviction court found that evidence to be credible. Dr. Lazaro testified that Mr. Morris suffers from all seven, excuse me, suffers from antisocial personality disorder and has all seven of the criteria. He suffers from narcissistic personality disorder, which he has, I think, seven of nine of the criteria. Mr. Volk testified at the evidentiary hearing that that was a great concern to them, but it didn't come as a surprise to them. Their own experts indicated that he likely has antisocial personality disorder. Dr. Taylor, who did one of the competency evaluations, testified that he had, excuse me, reported to counsel that Mr. Morris has antisocial personality disorder. One of the neuropsychologists hired by counsel pre-trial, Dr. Sesta, attempted to evaluate Mr. Morris. Mr. Morris was not cooperative, but his opinion to defense counsel, based on his limited contact with Mr. Morris, is that Mr. Morris has clear-cut personality disorder. Mr. Volk testified it was something they didn't want to touch with a 10-foot pole. I think he stated something along the lines of, it's not a minefield that any of us wanted to run through to try and present evidence that would then leave the state to present evidence of antisocial personality disorder and narcissistic personality disorder. It was a completely reasonable decision on the part of counsel not to try and go there. There was nothing presented, again, at the post-conviction hearing that indicated that Mr. Morris actually suffered from schizophrenia. And even if there was, it's unlikely that counsel would have still wanted to go down that road unless he had some real mitigating evidence to present to either the jury or the court. With regard to some of the other claims that were raised, Ms. Price's testimony was exactly the same at the post-conviction hearing as it was at the trial. Importantly for this court's consideration is that the post-conviction court found that Ms. Price's testimony was credible and that Mr. Baird's testimony was not credible. And this is with reference to the newly discovered evidence claim. The court found that based on Mr. Baird's demeanor and the way he answered the questions, that his testimony was not credible. And even if it were introduced, it would not have changed the verdict in this case or the penalty. The checks are an interesting component of this argument as well because there are a couple of things that counsel considered in determining not to pursue that kind of defense. They were aware of the fact that the checks were passed in Jacksonville in 2008, which is two years before this murder, these murders, pardon me. And there are a couple of things. Number one, Mr. Bolt understood that if he were going to present this kind of evidence, he would have to explain why we know that it was not Mr. Morris who cashed those checks. And how we know that is because Mr. Morris was in the Department of Corrections when these checks were passed. Again, not something that defense counsel wanted to present to this jury during the trial of a man who was accused of murdering two police officers. Mr. Morris himself was resistant, sometimes insistent that he did not want to go down this road. And Mr. Bolt testified he was concerned that he would lose credibility with the jury if he tried to propose this kind of evidence in defense. Now, he would have had to do it in a case in chief. It would have been after the state's case. And the state's case does not begin and end with the passenger of that vehicle identifying himself as Dante Morris. The state has a considerable evidence that supports the truth, which is it was, in fact, Mr. Morris who was in that vehicle. When Officer Curtis pulls over that car, he obtains the information of the driver, Courtney Brantley, has her driver's license and I think her registration. He gets the information from the passenger of that car by asking some rapid fire questions. Passenger does not have identification on him or is at least not willing to give it to Officer Curtis. Officer Curtis writes down that information on a pad that he carries and he goes back to his patrol car. When he pulls up the information that he was given by that passenger, he sees in his in-dash computer that there is a warrant for this person's arrest. He sees not only that there is a warrant, he sees a picture of Mr. Morris, a person he just saw seconds before coming back here and looking at this particular screen and a person that he sees just seconds later when he goes back up to that car and shines a light in the face of the passenger before he says anything about the warrant. We also have the fact that Neela Keene, who was a resident of apartment complex close by, 
heard two shots. After hearing those two shots, very shortly after, she looks out her window and sees a black man running through the parking lot complex, uh, the apartment complex parking lot. She identifies that person as Mr. Morris in a photo lineup. Uh, Tamika Jones testifies that she encountered Mr. Morris just earlier that evening, has his um, contact information in her phone. He is listed as Quelo in her phone. Uh, Mr. Morris later identifies himself as Quelo when he's talking to uh, Ms. Price and some others uh, during a jail phone call. Um, we have texts, cell phone records that indicate that that phone number that's associated with Mr. Morris was in the location of the murders at the time of the murders. There are texts between Ms. Moore, uh, Mr. Morris and Ms. Brantley shortly after the murders where uh, uh, Mr. Morris is saying things like, you don't need to have your car parked there. Uh, they press their love for one another. He tells her to stay loyal and indeed she does. This notion that, well, there's this other um, phone number that might be associated uh, with Mr. Morris, or maybe that's how he knew what was going on. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, the post-conviction court, when that, that evidence was uh, floated, said it's utter speculation. And it is utter speculation. We don't have any evidence that would establish that there was another person in that car other than Mr. Morris. Of course, we have officers who identify his voice. And we um, have, sadly, the fact that when the other officers arrive at this scene, they go into uh, Officer, Officer Curtis's uh, patrol car, and they see the name, the date of birth, and the picture of Dante Morris on Officer Curtis's screen. The thought that defense counsel would be able to credibly argue that Officer Curtis, a trained and experienced law enforcement officer, was as easily fooled and no disrespect to public's clerks. But it is an entirely different thing to present a check to a public's clerk who will cash it for you than it is for a trained and experienced law enforcement officer who is about to execute an arrest warrant, which is an extremely high risk encounter for all law enforcement officers, that Officer Curtis was fooled just as easily as a public's clerk. It was not something that uh, defense counsel thought was persuasive evidence, and it ran the risk of just reemphasizing all the other corroborating evidence that the state had that proved that it was indeed Mr. Morris who was in that vehicle and who murdered both Officer Curtis and uh, Officer Kopat. Um, Mr. Oglesby, Oglesby's testimony, I will say what the post-conviction court said, it was rather incredible. It would have changed the verdict regardless. Um, and I think that Mr. Gold testified that they did have some information about Mr. Oglesby, but there were some credibility problems with his testimony, so they didn't want to present it, and it wouldn't have made a difference regardless. Uh, I think I've addressed most of the things that counsel has raised. I'd be happy to ask, answer any questions that the court has. Hearing none, I would ask that this court affirm the denial of post-conviction relief. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. We'll uh, now have a uh, rebuttal argument. Thank you, Chief Justice. May it please the court. Your honors, on rebuttal, I'd like to first address the Brady claim, especially the statement that the state um, did disclose this evidence and that that is on the record. And all we see on the record is in fact that the state did not disclose a working version of this video. What we do not have on the record was whether the state disclosed the 1121 stipulated November 10, 2011 video to defense counsel that could have been open and reviewed by Dr. McLean. Now, now also addressing Dr. McLean's testimony. Now, your honors, it is not necessary for a finding of materiality in the evidence, uh, the fact that Dr. McClay would have made an alternative diagnosis because it would have changed the course of her investigation regarding Mr. Morris's mental health and it would have changed her recommendation to defense counsel regarding the penalty phase. And it also would have changed the statement, Ira Pepper killing being unchallenged before the jury. Now, your honors, Dr. McClain did testify that she was unable to present schizophrenia or a psychotic type disorder as a viable diagnosis until reviewing this video. No one did in fact know what was on this video because what was known was that Mr. Morris was stating that he was hearing voices, that he had been taken to the dark side. It was, it was painted by the state as someone having a religious experience and, and, and having feelings of doubt 
um, about themselves and about their standing in terms of their religious ideation. And it wasn't until this video that Dr. McLean noted, he differentiates the voices he's hearing from that of his cellmates, which the state again said that the voices he was hearing could have been people through the vents and that's what he was referencing. On this video, he differentiates that he had not done so otherwise. On this video, it is noted by Dr. McLean that this is not a religious salvation type things with the darkness because he is saying that the voices are doing this to him, that this type of pers persecutory belief is very evident in um, individuals with schizophrenia and that he did not wanna go back to the voices. He didn't want to hear them again, that he was having an internal struggle that he was explaining to his mother, which shows that he, he, he couldn't have control over these voices. This was not known prior to this. That is why, Your Honors, Dr. McLean did not explore any alternative diagnosis than the one that she originally provided, why she did not think and why no one had any evidence of Mr. Morris having schizophrenia because no one was able to view this video, Your Honors, because it was not provided in working version by the state. And at this time, the defense simply requests that the record be completed, that we've been given the opportunity as required by the rule and this court's precedent to put on evidence regarding whether or not this was disclosed, whether or not this evidence that was disclosed was suppressed, and whether or not that suppression materially prejudiced Mr. Morris, which we see in conjunction with all of the other evidence put forth during the post-conviction proceeding, attacking, again, the individual knowing the information about Mr. Morris, Ms. Price's credibility, about the cell phone records and the statements even made now by Ms. McHugh, McHugh, your honors, the cell phone records earlier in the day show that Mr. Morris and Ms. Brantley broke up and it was unlikely that he would be the one in the car with her that evening. And the third individual is not an individual in the car, your honors, it's an individual having a conversation at the time of the murders with the phone number attributed to Mr. Morris and Ms. Brantley that could have been the individual in the car, that phone number. And your honors, it also, um, was referenced by defense counsel during opening statements about these worthless checks and never followed up on. And this court has considered that deficient previously. And your honors, that is why Mr. Morris respectfully requests an opportunity to complete his record, to put forth the evidence regarding his Brady claim. And if in the alternative that this court finds that counsel was ineffective and that in light of this newly discovered evidence, counsel's ineffectiveness and all of the evidence produced during post-conviction and this Brady evidence that Mr. Morris was prejudiced, that the likelihood that the jury would have found him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt is now unreliable and he is entitled to a new guilt phase and penalty phase proceedings. Thank you, your honors. We thank you both uh, for your arguments today. That's the final case on today's docket. This session of court is now concluded.